Um, I would like to thank the Center for Economic Policy and Research for sponsoring tonight's um, talk by Dean Baker, and Dean is the co-director of the Center. If you would like more information about um, the Center, there, there's a table over here where you can sign up for emails and, and gather literature. So Dean Baker um, is the author of several books, including tonight's feature the title, False Profits Recovering from the Bubble Economy. He's also written Plunder and Blunder, The Rise and Fall of the Bubble Economy, and The United States Since 1980, among, among other books. He's a columnist for The Guardian, American Prospect, truthout.org, uh, writes regularly for Washington Post, Atlantic, and Financial Times. Uh, he appears frequently on NPR, CNN, CNBC, and PBS's NewsHour. Um, his PhD is, is in economics from the University of Michigan, and we are proud and happy to welcome the Dean Baker back to Bustle Ways and Poets. So welcome to Thanks for the, the intro. I think I had to change part of that in terms of rights regulate for the Washington Post. I don't think I've written for them for quite a while. In my blog, I've taken to referring to them as Fox on 15th Street. So, so I don't think they're going to be walk, writing for them, uh, at least uh, not, not in the normal formats anytime soon. So uh, glad people came out tonight. Uh, it's not been a great time, great week, at least in my view. Um, I really did not arrange for Harry Reid to have the Senate approve Ben Bernanke today. That was a coincidence. Um, not a lot of good news in my view this week. Uh, the State of the Union address, I think, uh, was a disappointment to me and probably many other people. And it, it, was, uh, it, was, it was my hope, uh, not that I was rooting for the, the economic crisis, but I was hoping that at least something positive would come out of it. And at the moment, I have to say, things don't look really good. Um, I will, so I'm gonna, actually what I want to do is I'm going to read a small section. I don't usually read from my book because it tends to be boring even to me, but I, I happen to be looking it over today. I haven't looked at it back you know, since I wrote it in, in the summer. And I happened to look at it. I was going, well, actually, kind of probably not a bad thing to talk about now. So I'm going to start reading a section of the book and then say a little bit about how I think you know, we're sort of losing right now, how we're losing the debate. And then I'm going to end on a more optimistic note because there are some very positive developments. I'm still hopeful that... Um, we might actually pull some things out of this crisis that will be for the long-term benefit. So I'm going to go on, give you the positive sun at the end of this. All right, well, starting just the, the, uh, with the negatives. Um, a massive wave of foreclosures and mortgage loan defaults are also, are also inevitable parts of this story. That story being, of course, the collapse of the housing bubble. Millions of people would have lost their homes even without the tsunami of junk loans the banks issued during the bubble years. When house prices plunge below the value of the mortgage, homeowners have less means and incentive to struggle to meet their payments. The huge job loss from this recession also propelled the massive wave of foreclosures. None of this is complicated or mysterious. Anticipating this disaster didn't require brilliant insights or complex models. In fact, a good student in an introductory economics course would have possessed all the knowledge needed to see this train wreck coming. However, the political elites do not want the official story to be that simple. They don't want the public to know that the people holding the top economic pol policy positions are incompetent, corrupt, or both. By bearing the story in complexity, these elites are trying to confuse the American public. The confusion begins when the media and the politicians routinely refer to the recession as a financial crisis. The implication is that the financial system is at the root of the problem that fixing the financial system is the way to restore the economy to its normal growth path. Although the failings of financial regulation certainly allowed the bubble to grow much larger than otherwise would have been possible, and the troubles in the financial system have aggravated the downturn, the current economic situation would be little changed if the financial system were instantly restored to perfect health. The core problem is that the economy develops serious imbalances as a result of the growth of the housing bubble. In the short term, the only way to offset the loss of demand caused by the collapse of the housing bubble is through massive deficit spending. In the longer term, a reduction in the value of the dollar would be necessary to restore more balance to U.S. trade. However, the political elites, led by the managers of the financial industry, do not want to allow for a discussion that results in a policy prescription of large deficits and a lower value dollar. Such policies would go directly against their financial interests and indict the policy agenda they promoted for more than a decade. Rather than let people see the simple story, the 
political elites are anxiously touting the complexity of the situation. They want to focus the debate on complex derivative instruments like credit default swaps or collateralized debt obligations. In this way, they hope to quickly confuse and lose the public. They can then assert that the problems are so complicated that no one could be blamed for not having foreseen them. After all, we're only human, and no one can predict the future. Okay, well, I really I just happened to look back at this. I, as I said, I literally had not looked at this since August because I hate reading my own work. Maybe everyone has that attitude towards my work. But, but I really didn't want to look at it again after having spent the time writing it. I happened to look at it today, and it seemed to fit perfectly what was happening with Ben Bernanke's reappointment. Because, to my mind, you had such a clear case here. How could you mess up on your job more completely than did Ben Bernanke? I mean, think about this. We're sitting here with 10% unemployment. We have 20 million homeowners who are underwater in their mortgage. We have tens of millions of people who are nearing retirement, have lost much of, most of their savings. And Ben Bernanke, I won't blame him exclusively, Alan Greens, and of course probably deserves more blame, but in any case, he was Alan Greens' Ben's sidekick. He was primarily responsible for this, and here he is getting reappointed. And, you know, the analogies I make, I mean, this might sound crude to people, but it's appropriate. The school bus driver gets drunk and kills all the kids. You then tell him to go out and drive the kids to school the next day? I mean, this is close to crazy. But you get this discussion here where, you know, Ben Bernanke is a very brilliant man, which I'm sure he is. I, I only know him very casually, but, you know, I'm sure he's a very bright guy. I've read many of his writings, and I'm sure that's true. But the fact is that he failed disastrously, but you can't have that discussion. Now, where does this go? Why do we get in this situation? Well, we're told constantly, and there's a great example of this just in the New York Times today. Alan Blinder, another very good economist from Princeton, he had a column in the New York Times today where he was saying, we should be thankful that we had Ben Bernanke, because if it were not for Ben Bernanke, we would have had another Great Depression. Now, I don't know how many people I've heard saying this in the context of this financial crisis at different points, that if we didn't do what we were supposed to do, what the elites had wanted us to do, we'd get another Great Depression. And I always have fun with this one, because the, the next thing I'd like to ask is, how? And you invariably get people shut up very quickly, because there is no answer to that. You know? So in other words, you know, suppose in the obvious case where this came up, if you go back to the fall of 2008, when they were saying we had to pass the tarp right away, do the things, $700 billion, no question asked. If we didn't do that, we'd get a Great Depression. How would that happen? And I could tell a story. We could all tell a story. Okay, you wouldn't have more banks spent fail, you know, you have uh, more financial collapse, but how does that give you 10 years of double-digit unemployment? I, I don't know, in all honesty. I literally do not know. Now, I would say, absolutely, it was better that we didn't have a full-scale financial collapse. In other words, we didn't have our whole banking system collapse in the fall of 2008. But I couldn't tell you a story, of, even if that had happened, how that would have given us a Great Depression. Presumably, what would have happened in that situation was that the Federal Reserve Board and the FDIC would have taken over the banks. So all the people who are running the banks today, Lloyd Blankfein at Goldman and uh, Jamie Dimon at J.P. Morgan, they would presumably be out on the street looking for a job. Um, the stockholders would, of course, lose their money. The bondholders, people who had lent money to, to, to J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs, would you know, lose much, if not all, of their, their money. Um, there would be repercussions from that. But we would still have the financial system operating. I mean, we know the Fed does know how to keep things operating. That's not that hard. They know how to do that. And we would more or less pick up the pieces and go back from there. Now, we would have to have more stimulus. We'd have to have the federal government spend more money. But the idea that we'd be sitting here with double-digit unemployment for a decade, like we had in the Great Depression, I literally don't know how that would come about unless we assume that not only we had, you know, the downturn, the collapse of the financial system, but we had basically prolonged stupidity. And then for a whole decade, we sat there with, you know, high unemployment, and we never took any actions to counteract that. That doesn't seem very likely to me. So you continually see this threat held out there, and that we're all somehow supposed to be thankful for the fact that we didn't have another Great Depression, when in fact we in a very, very horrible situation because these people messed up. So it's a great way of diverting our attention from what in fact is a horrible failure to supposedly a great success story. In fact, if you read Alan Blinder's column in the New York Times today, he says a few things that are just quite literally not true. 
So he says, for example, that because of Blinder's effective, I'm sorry, because of Bernanke's effective management of, of the economy in the period after the collapse of Lehman in, in the fall of 08, the economy's recovered, it's turned around, and it's done much better than anyone expected. That's almost a, a verbatim quote from there. Well, it's a great thing for Alan Blinder to say that because we could verify that. We know what people expect, their projections. So if we looked at what the Congressional Budget Office projected back in, say, January of 2009, we find that they were actually projecting a much better situation. They never thought the unemployment rate would cross 9%, or just barely cross 9%. It's over 10%, or it's 10% and likely to go higher. So it's a worse situation than what they projected. Same thing if we look at what, what the Obama administration projected back in, in January of 2009. They thought the unemployment rate would peak at 9%. I should point out that was if we had no stimulus, they thought the unemployment rate would peak at 9%. So the economy's clearly been much worse than what the Congressional Budget Office projected, what the Obama administration projected, and for that matter, what most private forecasters projected. But here's Alan Blinder telling us we should be thankful for Ben Bernanke's effective management of the economy. It's turned the economy around, and it's you know, now doing much better than ex anyone expected. Just flat out not true. So why is that out there in the debate? Why is a very prominent professor, and I have nothing against Alan Blinder, again, a good economist, you know, good, uh, um, good professor, why does he get out there and say something that's so clearly not true? And why is the New York Times printed? They have fact checkers. They can verify that you know, the economy's actually done worse than expected, not better than expected. Well, again, it's building up this mythology that you know, rather than Ben Bernanke being a horrible failure, a disaster, instead they flip it around and say, no, we're actually very fortunate that we had him there. You know, and it's really quite striking how deep this runs. You know, one of the things that, I don't know how close like anyone listens to my introduction, but one of the things I do, I write a column for The Guardian every week. So in the middle of the TARP, going back to the fall of 2008, in the middle of the debate over the TARP, you know, I was, as you might imagine, working, doing everything I could to try and get Congress not to approve the TARP, and I was writing things about it. So I wrote a column for the, for the Guardian, one of the things you discover when you write a newspaper column, that they never keep your headlines, at least that's my experience. They, so they, you know, I just write the headlines, I assume that you know, they're placeholders, they're gonna change them. So I wrote a column saying how, look, the banks really are the ones who stand to lose here, not us. You know, in other words, that they risk, you know, Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan, they risk going out of business, being taken over by the Fed, having their top executives thrown out on the street. So I wrote this column, that was the gist of it. They're the ones who stand to lose, not us. I said, so the title was, they have a gun pointed to their head, and they're threatening to shoot. Okay, well, the, the headline got turned around. The gun was pointed to our head when the Guardian ran it. They had a gun pointed to our head when they're threatening to shoot. That's how deep the ideology was. So here you had this notion, which again, if anyone could tell me how, I'm anxious to hear that. We could have in the question, someone could tell me how we would have had the Great Depression. I don't know anyone who could tell that story, but it was so so often repeated by people who ostensibly knew, you know, uh, Ellen Blinder, for example, ostensibly knew what they're talking about that it became a big part of the debate. And again, if the context is, well, we better give Goldman Sachs a lot of money or we can get the Great Depression, probably a good idea to do that. Uh, in fact, uh, Geithner said exactly that just, uh, I think it was yesterday, he was talking about the AIG debt a lot. He really hated to do it, but the alternative was you know, another Great Depression. So they created this bogeyman that has no reality whatsoever, and that's the context in which we debate policy. That's not a very good place to start. So once you've let them set up the structure of the debate, frame the structure of the debate in that way, you basically have lost. Okay? And that's essentially what happened with the TARP, and it's still happening today when you get guys that are talking about the bail out of AIG or Bernanke's reappointment. Let me just make another, another point along the same lines in this respect. One of the arguments that was used as to why we had to reappoint Bernanke was that it would lead to turbulence in financial markets, which sounds very scary. You know, who wants turbulent financial markets? Well, what does that really mean? I mean, you know, the, we had turbulence in financial markets back after Lehman collapsed. Turbulence in the sense that you did have the risk of financial markets literally shutting down. That's not what they meant, though, when they're talking about Bernanke, because there's no, no evidence, nothing I saw. I mean, no one had any stories that, you know, our financial markets were about to shut down if Bernanke wasn't reappointed. 
What did they mean? Well, they meant that the stock market was falling. Okay, well, that's close to crazy. I don't know any economist, left, right, or center, who would say that you would make economic policy based on day-to-day or even week-to-week movements in the stock market. Who cares? Who cares? That's close to crazy. Now, would the stock market fall? Suppose we did something that was going to be really bad for, for the Wall Street banks. Would the stock market fall? Yeah, it's going to fall. They're a big chunk of the value of the, the, the stock market. You know, if you take Goldman, J.P. Morgan, you know, the other big banks, that's a big chunk of the value of the stock market. So if our criteria of policy is that the stock market doesn't fall, well, I guess we can't do anything to the banks, right? Now, the reality is, why on earth would we care? Now, if I had a million dollars in Goldman Sachs, I guess I would care. But the fact is, almost no one has a million dollars in Goldman Sachs. The vast majority of people do not have a lot of money in the stock market. It's certainly not in the Wall Street banks. So who cares if the stock market goes down for a week or two weeks or three weeks, even if it stays low? It has no impact on the economy. But yet again, we've allowed the terminology, we've allowed the debate to be framed so that if the stock market goes down, that's a bad thing. But we've lost the game if that's the basis of the conversation. It doesn't make sense. That's not good economics. It's garbage. But yet you get that argument put out there. So again, we have to be careful how these things get framed. And unfortunately, to date at least, they've been framed in a way that you know both doesn't make sense, and it's very disadvantageous for any sort of progressive policy. Okay, well let me flip this over. I don't want to go on a great length of the other questions, but let me just flip this over and tell you what I do see as, as, as a potentially positive, as a bright side of this. Um, one of the issues that I've done work on since I came to Washington in 1992 is a financial transactions tax. Um, the idea, most of you have probably heard of this at this point, or I should say speculation tax, we're calling it a financial speculation tax. The idea is that if you had a very small tax on financial speculation, say half of 1% on the stock trade, or a quarter on each side, a quarter of 1% on each side, it would have very little effect on anyone who does long-term investing. So we know people do invest in the stock market for you know, their savings for retirement, kids' education, other things, nothing wrong with that. People do that, and we don't want to punish them for that. But on the other hand, you have people that are buying and selling by the day or even by the hour, and that can lead to a lot of volatility in, in the stock market. It's a lot of waste. Um, and it leads to, it takes the financial system away from what it's designed for. The financial system is there to serve the real economy, serve the productive economy. So when we get a large volume of transactions, we're taking the financial system away from what it's in fact designed to do. I mean, one of the points I often make is financial systems, we should think of finance as an intermediate good. It's like trucking. Uh, you know, we, we need trucking because we need to get our goods, you know, our food has to get from point A to point B. Obviously, we need trucking. But trucking's not an end in itself. No one's going to go, oh, that's great. We have you know, way more trucks on the road. You know, if we had five times as many people employed in the trucking industry, anyone in their right mind would go, well, what's wrong with your trucking industry? You know, why is it so inefficient? Well, that's in effect what's happened with the financial sector over the last three decades. It's gotten incredibly inefficient. The share of the private economy that's devoted to the financial sector, and they're just in very narrowly investment banking, securities dealing, commodity trading. The share of the economy that's devoted to the, that narrow sector of, the, of finance has quintupled over the last three decades. Okay, so you go, well, what have we gotten for that? And you'd be very hard pressed. I mean, you somehow think that we're allocating capital better, that we're, you know, businesses are finding it easier to start up today than was true 20 or 30 years ago. Are our savings more secure? Do we think we're getting better service from our banks, from the financial industry? I think you'd be hard pressed to argue any of those things. So what we see is that we have an effect of incredibly bloated financial sector. And that's the context in which the financial speculation tax makes a lot of sense. That if we had a relatively small tax on financial transactions, that would discourage this massive increase in trading in speculation that we've seen over the last three decades. And I've done some calculations on this with a friend of mine, Robert Paul, who's a professor at, at the University of Massachusetts. And we calculated that you could get on the order of 150, 160 billion a year from having a set of very modest financial transactions taxes. Well, I've been talking, uh, Bob and I actually wrote that paper back in 2001 or 2002. I've been writing about this, talking about this for a long, long time. It was never taken very seriously. But what I'm happy to say now is that as a result, clearly, of this crisis, 
this is now something that is serious and is actually on the agenda. And you have bills in both the House and Senate, and the House uh, a bill introduced by, by Peter DeFazio from Oregon, and the Senate a bill introduced by Tom Harkin from Iowa that put forward financial transactions taxes. Now, they're very far from passage. I don't have delusions about this. But the point is they are now being taken seriously. The Wall Street Journal has written about this. The New York Times came out in editorial for it. Very mainstream economist, uh, Alan Sinai, who's, I guess, a Democrat, but a very, very centrist Democrat, came out for a financial speculation tax. This is not a serious proposition. It is something that it's no longer a laughable story, that the act can actually happen. So I guess all I just say is that we've had a lot of real big disappointments. I mean, you should have a situation where the elites that got us into this should be going around with bags over their head. I mean, they really blew it. It was really simple to see. An $8 trillion housing bubble is not, you know, it's not invisible. You don't flip under the table, under the rug. It was really easy to see. The massive amount of, of bad loans going out there. You know, the idea that Alan Greenspan didn't know about them, Ben Bernanke didn't know about them. What do they do for a living? You know, you really have to be hiding not to know about them if you were a bank regulator and you somehow missed this. So this was incredible negligence. They should be in hiding. But remarkably, they're still calling the shots. But the flip side is that there is this populist sentiment out there. People are very angry, as they should be. And that does create the potential to actually bring about change. So we haven't gotten there yet. There's a lot of really bad things in the news. Again, I'm pretty unhappy about Ben Bernanke. I didn't like the State of the Union address. But there are some real grounds for hope. And you know, I just say, uh, if we get a financial transaction tax, that's not going to change the world, change everything. But that would be a really big step. So I'll stop with that and take questions. I'm going to bring the mic around, so please wait for the mic before you ask your question. And uh, I did want to mention one more thing I forgot to mention at the outset, which is that the books that are sale in the bookstore at the other end of us, Boys and Poets. So at some point during the evening, make your way into the bookstore, purchase the book there, and we're going to do the signing in this room here, at the, here in, front of the, in front of the stage, we'll do the signing here, okay? And uh, we get the first question. Do you see any sign that the Democrats can get ahead of the Republicans on these banking issues? Is the president talking to anybody that you, you know, any chance? Well, I think the story here is that they're implying these are all politicians are going to go the path of least resistance. The path of least resistance is to not do anything to the banks because obviously they get a lot of support from the financial industry, up and down. You know, certainly the, the Democrats in the House and the Senate, uh, President Obama, they've all gotten a lot of support from the financial industry. Um, so the easiest path is basically just sort of bless the status quo and do some token, you know, some symbolic gestures that don't really mean anything. Um, but they know that there are a lot of people angry out there. That's why you have the, uh, the, the upset in, in Massachusetts, and you clearly have a lot of people in the country. I mean, they look at the polls, obviously, every day, and you have a lot of people that are very, very angry. So if you get to a situation where people are not willing to accept symbolic gestures, they actually want to see substance, they actually want to see change, then there's some hope. I mean, they do want to get reelected. Um, but it's, it's definitely an uphill struggle. I mean, it's, you know, one of the things, particularly with the financial sector, and this is always true, obviously, politicians always prefer symbolic actions to, to, to uh, substantive ones, but the financial sector thrives. I mean, it's about loopholes. You know, to, I'll just give you one example that, you know, it's close to home. You might recall back in the fall of uh, 2008, we had this story about how the Metro um, had to, might have to make a payment of, I think it was $400 million. And the question was, where would they get that? They didn't have $400 million. And I remember thinking about that going, well, I used the Metro, and it would really be horrible if the Metro had to shut down. And, and then I thought, well, well, how did they end up in this situation? Well, the, the story was that the Metro, Metro had a situation where they were, they, they had bought subway cars, and then they sold them, and they were leasing them back. And they had to get an insurance policy on their lease. And the insurance policy was with AIG. Now, the condition of the lease was that it had to be a AAA insurer, which AIG no longer was. So they could, the, the person, the, the, the company, I forget who it was, that they were leasing the, the, the cars from, had the right to demand payment in full immediately. 
you know, if that fell through. So the question was, well, can you work something out? Of course they did, we got the metro system operating. But the question is, why did you have the situation in the first place? Well, this was tax arbitrage. So what was going on is that, you know, Metro is a public entity. They can't depreciate subway cars. On the other hand, the bank, whoever it was they sold it to, I don't know who, who the deal was, I don't remember who the deal was with, they could depreciate the subway cars. The AIG comes in there as an intermediary, and they split up the money. They split up the tax break. Now, that's a way in which the federal government is, in fact, subsidizing the purchase of subway cars, you know, for, for Metro, and, you know, there were other local governments that were doing the same. That's not necessarily a bad policy, but if the federal government wants to subsidize the purchase of subway cars, why not just do it directly? Why bring in the intermediaries? Well, obviously that wasn't the intention, but you had some clever person at AIG or wherever who came up with this. Well, that's what the financial industry is about. Credit default swaps. What the hell are credit default swaps? Credit default swaps are bond insurance. But the magic of credit default swaps is unlike bond insurance are not regulated. So they came up with this new instrument that avoided all the regulation out there, and AIG could go out and issue trillions of dollars of credit default swaps, and they didn't have to you know, answer to any regulators. So when you talk about financial reform, if you don't bolt everything down, you're wasting your time. And just to be very concrete here, you know, we had the Volcker Rule, and I and a lot of others were going, well, that's a good thing, you know, that you're going to separate out proprietary trading so you won't have you know, commercial banks being able to speculate with insured deposits. And then you read what's there, well, I can't imagine that, you know, Goldman and Citigroup and all the others, that they won't just, you know, blow that right away. It'll be as though it was never written. So if you want financial reform, you really have to bolt it down. It has to be very concrete. And at the moment, my bet would be we're not going to see that. So we're not going to see it unless, you know, people get angry enough that they insist on really changing the situation. And that's one reason why I really like the financial transaction tax. It's really concrete. We'll know whether it's there or not. We're, no, we're going to know if we're collecting $100 billion in taxes from the financial industry. We will know that. That's something that's really concrete. A lot of the other things, you know, they'll say, oh, we put these regulations in place, everything's good. And, you know, some of us might know that, but most of the public will never really know because, you know, they're not nerds and they're not reading this up. They won't know and maybe they'll be fooled. But with the financial transactions tax, that's really concrete. We'll know if we're getting $100 billion a year from these guys. Second one, I don't think, you know, I don't think there's anything that concrete. I think it was just designed to scare people and have that effect. You know, so I don't think that they had like, you know, that there was any plan we're going to give you the Great Depression. I think it was more just, you know, we really, really want to scare you. So, you know, had they not gotten the chart, what would have happened? Well, you know, they would have. These guys certainly have an interest in not having the U.S. economy collapse. I mean, they have more to lose than the rest of us. You know, if you're you know, you're running Goldman Sachs and you have a few million dollars, you have more to lose than most of us, you know, we don't have a thousand that amount of money. So I don't think they would have, like, deliberately threw the economy into a Great Depression. Um, so I think it really was just a scare tactic, and, and it worked. They go out and say it, and, and it's really like a stupid thing. I mean, I wrote a column once where I said, how do you make a, a D.C. policy walk look as inarticulate as Sarah Palin being, being interviewed by Katie Curran? And, and the answer was, ask them how it would give us the Great Depression. None of them do. No one give you an answer. Go, you know, find whoever's the big advocate of the chart. Ask them. They won't give you an answer. They don't know. They just, you know, they heard someone else say it, so they're supposed to sound smart. They just repeat the same thing. They have no idea what they're talking about. They might, have, they might have a law degree from Harvard, but I'll guarantee you, they do not know what they're talking about. So it was just, you know, this was just nonsense, but it did its job. It scared people. It got the tarp. We did the same thing with Bernanke. You know, you better approve him or it'll be really, really bad news. Now, the AAG story, this is really a remarkable story. I won't go into great details. I don't know all the details. But the, the, the basic story here is fairly straightforward. AIG was bankrupt. Okay, well, they owed a ton of money, tens of billions of dollars, largely to other banks, like Goldman Sachs, 13 billion specifically to Goldman Sachs. They owed, I think, two or three billion to Morgan Stanley, um, several foreign banks. Okay, well, if, if AIG goes under, Goldman Sachs doesn't get their money. JP Morgan doesn't get their money. That's what happens when companies go bankrupt. 
you don't collect on your debts. So what happens? Well, the Fed steps in and they say, well, we can't withstand the collapse. You know, since the day after Lehman went under, it'd be too much of a strain for the financial system. So we're going to keep AIG intact. We're going to give them the money, and we're going to pay the debts in full. And what Geithner, the official line from Geithner, who was the head of New York Fed at the time, so he played a very central role in this, and also Bernanke, was they really didn't want to pay them in full, but they just couldn't see any alternative. Now, it's interesting here, because we, we saw something, we did see an alternative. You know, we had General Motors and Chrysler both went bankrupt. And the bondholders, people who were owed money by General Motors and Chrysler, took very big haircuts. I think they got about 10 cents on the dollar. Now, I don't quite understand. I'm not a lawyer, I'm not an expert on bankruptcy law, but it's a little hard for me to believe that there was no way for the Federal Reserve Board to maneuver this so that you had an orderly work out there where you ended up with Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan and the rest getting considerably less than 100 cents on the dollar. They would not have gotten that if they just let the market take its course. Again, one of the things I love to point out, these people are not free market fundamentalists. Don't ever call them free market fundamentalists. They're people who want the government to give them lots of money, and that's exactly what happened there. So, you know, in this case, my guess is they knew what they were doing was corrupt, which is why there was so much secrecy around it, why they re redacted the forms, they apparently had false filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission. You know, was Geithner involved in that? I don't know. Was Bernanke involved in that? I don't know. They had authority over it. Were they personally involved? It's certainly suspicious, but, you know, but I don't know. But clearly, there were a lot of things that happened that, that were very improper. And filing false forms with the Securities and Exchange Commission was never proper. So, you know, there were a lot of things that should not have happened there. Corruption suggests that you Thank you. Corruption suggests that somebody's making money off of it. If you use the term corruption about, say, the tripart heads of the you know, Bernanke and Wagner and all, are they getting rich? Is somebody putting money in their pocket to do this? What is their motivation? I mean, I really don't know these people personally. I suspect they're they're very happy to hold you know high office, you know, chair of the Federal Reserve Board, Treasury Secretary. My guess, I have no idea, but you know, it's common for people after those they leave those positions to make enormous amounts of money in the private sector. For example, Alan Greenspan is you know so, you know he goes on gives a talk, he gets several hundred thousand dollars. He's working for Pimco, I believe it is, and he gets like millions of dollars as a consultant. Or I don't know exactly what his title is. So I, I suspect a combination of the prestige of holding these positions and certainly if they want it, the promise of very big paychecks down the road. I, I don't doubt that Secretary Geithner and Bernanke, you know, when they leave those positions, will be able to get very high paying jobs in, in, in the private and financial industry. You made a reference to the uh, <clears throat> Massachusetts election. Can you talk a little more about the, the Tea Party and, and uh, because it's very much an anti elite uh, movement uh, and very much uh, contesting for uh, control of uh, anti uh, Republican agencies? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm not going to to be an expert on the Tea Party people, but I, I think it's fair to say, I mean, obviously they're anti-elite. They have very ill-informed opinions on many issues. Um, I don't think they're obviously left or right. They're, they tend to be anti-government because they perceive the government is acting against their interests. And in a lot of ways, that's true. So, so that's not, it, it, it's not wrong to tell these people that the government, you know, when they see what happened with the bailouts, it's not wrong to tell them that the government's not looking out for their interests. Um, so, uh, you know, I, obviously the right has sort of seized on, uh, on the, the Tea Party people because, you know, they're, they're the ones jumping on that. But I don't think they're inherently necessarily right wing. Uh, but again, if they don't see sort of a progressive populist path, they will be right wing. Um, and right now, I'm not sure how much of a progressive populist path is out there. So they can easily, they look to the Obama administration, they identify them with Wall Street, and they go, well, who else is there? And, you know, the Republicans standing there. So um, it's, I, I think it's going to be important, given that we're looking in all probability situation where we have a very bad economy for several years to come, 
it's going to be very important that there are progressive solutions for these people. And at the moment, at least, I don't see how anyone can look at the Obama administration and say that they're coming from there. Um, you know, again, just to throw one more number out, the latest projections from the Congressional Budget Office, you know, they came out with these new projections for the budget, and everyone talked about the deficits. Well, they also came out with projections for unemployment. And they increased them. They projected unemployment, even if it's supposed to be over 10% is a year on average for this year, over 9% for next year, and it's still supposed to be 8% in 2012. I mean, that's really horrible. We, we had our first stimulus package back when the unemployment rate hit 4.8%. You know, so the idea we have 8% unemployment, even two and a half, three years from now, is a really bad story. And there's nothing that the Obama administration is talking about right now that could qualitatively change that picture. So if they don't hear anything coming from the left that deals with their problem, they're going to go to the right, even if it's nuts. You know, even if it's just, you know, stupid, crazy stuff that's not going to help them either, because at least they have the pretext. And it's very hard to see, you know, what, what is the Obama administration proposing that's really going to improve their situation? Um, first, I wanted to thank you, uh, not just for the great comments tonight and for the book, and I bought the book, mm -hmm. urge others to buy the book, but also you're one of the most uh, uh, effective, not only economists with a progressive perspective, but uh, partners in the movement for building a uh, uh, better economy uh, that really works for, for people. So I wanted to just thank you very, very much. And then, financial reform off the ground. So insofar as there is a progressive lobby on financial reform issues, we largely have Heather to thank for that. So organization. Um, I wonder if uh, since there is reform moving ahead now, and in addition to joining with you on some things that are uh, may not be as feasible now but still to push the limits around the financial speculation tax, which is terrific and we know is where trying to promote that as heavily as we can. Um, but within the context of what we've got now, um, what are the, what sort of the uh, three or five point program you might promote that would be uh, the nuts, you know, the, the, the nugget of what we need to fight for uh, now so that we uh, move this both legislatively and politically. Okay, well, a few things. Um, first off, one of the things I think we definitely should push, and of course we are pushing this, is, is getting rid of too big to fail. Because um, this is something, it really is hard to defend. And you can go among the most right-wing people and go, don't you believe in a market? You know, when you have banks that are too big to fail, the idea is that everyone knows that J.P. Morgan does something really stupid, they put themselves on the edge of collapse, which obviously can happen, because they did this last fall. Um, the government's going to come and bail them out. That's not a market economy. You know, that means that if I want to lend money, well, I don't have much money to lend, but if some, if some wealthy person wants to lend money to J.P. Morgan, they don't care whether J.P. Morgan's doing good things, bad, I mean, morally, you know, are they doing smart investments or not? They don't have to worry, because if J.P. Morgan's doing stupid things, the government will bail them out. So too big to fail makes no sense. So I think breaking up the too big to fail things. Also, the other thing that's really nice, as we know, that's one that's really simple. So some of these things get fairly complex, and you know you get into details quickly, and you know people get lost. Too big to fail is simple, and you don't even have to have that much argument over it. I mean, in a certain sense, you know, where's the line? Is it a hundred billion? Is it two hundred billion? That, that might be an argument, but no one could tell you with a straight face that J.P. Morgan did something really stupid. We would let it fail. You know, their assets are about 1.8 trillion, somewhere around there. So it's way over, you know, by a factor of four, what anyone would think is, you know, a, a favorable bank. So, so too big to fail, I would say, is front and center. Breaking up the, you know, separating the investment banks from commercial banks, restoring, in effect, Glass-Steagall type regulation. Because, again, this gets to a very simple principle. If you want to speculate, if you want to take bets, you know, and be a high flyer, go start a hedge fund. Don't have a bank. Okay. The banks are, those are protected by the Federal Deposit Insur Insurance Corporation, the Federal Reserve Board. They're government protected. So we're, we're going to protect banks that are narrowly engaged in sort of loan activities, sort of simple, boring operations that don't get them into trouble. 
though that's fine. That's what the Federal Reserve Board's there. That's what the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation's there for. It's not for protecting a hedge fund. Hedge funds are going to win sometimes, they'll lose sometimes, and that's supposed to be their problem. So I think, again, restoring the Glass-Steagall type system. And, you know, again, I'm afraid the Volcker rule doesn't go far enough. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's a gesture in the right direction, but it doesn't go far enough. Um, a couple other things, uh, certainly, you know, getting derivatives to be exchange traded. We, we do some steps that way in the bill that got through the house, but there are enough, enough loopholes that I sort of think, I mean, the joke I've been saying about it is basically it requires that all the derivatives that they want to be exchange traded will be exchange traded. You know, the ones they don't want um, that they'll, they'll, they, they can drive, drive a truck through those loopholes. Um, I'd like to see us do something in housing. Um, I think it's really unfortunate that we're going the wrong direction because basically of all these people who are hugely underwater in their mortgages, there's no hope they'll ever have equity in their home. So rather than drag them along saying, well, maybe we could do a workout, this and that, just keep you know, paying your mortgage, you know, one of the things that I, I've proposed and we've been working on in CEPR is right to rent. Just change the rules on foreclosure, recognize we're in an extraordinary situation, and say that if you get foreclosed, you have the right to stay in your home as a renter, paying the market rent for a substantial period of time, five or ten years. Immediately gives everyone housing security, prevents having these vacant homes that are blight on the neighborhood, and also gives the banks a real incentive to, to have modifications themselves, because it's much less attractive to them to foreclose a home if they might get stuck with a tenant for ten years. So those are those would be my top four. I mean, obviously the financial speculation tax, which I already went on about, so that would give us give us the full five. Um, I have two questions. The first is about the kind of tax. I was wondering if you thought that's something that would work um, just if the US did it alone or whether London, Frankfurt, and you know, those kind of financial centers need to be doing as well. And the second question is about uh, what, might, what might cause the Great Depression if we didn't support the banks. Now, the argument that's being pushed very strongly by the government of the UK, which has to justify why it not earns several of the banks, is that. Um, if we didn't support the banks, then they wouldn't loan to small and medium sized businesses, and then um, those businesses are very dependent on the credit, and they would no longer be able to contact our operations much longer, including the flexibility of that. Okay, well, the first part, the, in terms of can, can the United States do a financial speculation tax on its own, we don't, this is something, you know, and I've debated people on this, and they always, you know, they have their list of arguments as to, you know, why that can never work. It, this is one you don't have to argue over, because England has, the United Kingdom has a financial speculation tax. They've had it for decades. It's, it's, it's half of 1% on the stock trades. They raise the equivalent relative to their GDP of about $30 billion a year. And London's still the most vibrant financial market in Europe. So, you know, yes, you could do the tax, you could raise lots of money, and it's still a very vibrant capital market. So, absolutely. I mean, it would be best to have international coordination, but it's not a precondition. And I always say this because there's, there's a long history in the United States. You know, for example, you have a lot of politicians that say they'd like to have labor standards in, in trade agreements, but we can't get the countries to agree to it. You know, and you think about it for a moment. I mean, the U.S. is negotiating with Panama. We're negotiating with you know, Costa Rica, and, and we said, oh, you know, we really want it, but we can't get them, you know, we, I mean, it's, it's on the face of it absurd, but, you know, that's why we don't have labor standards in our trade agreements, so, you know, yeah, if we really wanted this, we could get, particularly since the, the prime ministers of France, of England, of Germany, they all come out already for financial speculation taxes, but, you know, I have this feeling if we get to this room and you know, we get our, our representatives that go, well, we tried to get it, but we just couldn't work it out, you know. So the point is, we could do it unilaterally. We should go ahead with the idea we're going to do it unilaterally. And ideally, we'll negotiate some standard package with other countries, you know, with our major trading partners. But we absolutely can do it unilaterally. So I think that should be the focus. We're prepared to go ahead unilaterally. Ideally, we negotiate some common set of taxes of regulation with other countries. Now, in terms of the second proposition, Again, this gets back, you know, there, there's, there, there's, to my mind, I would say this is a mythology about, you know, the, the problems of how the financial sector affect the economy, but we don't have lending, that, you know, the, the banks aren't willing to lend. Well, yeah, the banks aren't willing to lend, but this is something that happens in every downturn. I remember when, when, when the TARP, the debate was going on about the TARP, and people talked about lending collapse. I, I found a quote from Alan Greenspan talking about how I've never seen such a fall off in lending that banks just won't make loans. It was very dramatic except it was from 1991. Uh, lending falls off in recessions. 
they do at the end of the day want to make money. So if they think they have good loan opportunities, they will generally take them. I mean, you don't know as a matter of principle any banker that will make money if they have the option to. So, so I don't doubt that lending is somewhat curtailed or gun shy or cautious. But the main story here is, I think, much more on the demand side than the supply side. So this idea that you know we're having this because banks won't make loans, it's, they won't make loans because there aren't good lending opportunities. And just let me carry this one step further. The, the story of the financial collapse, the, the part that I, I was going to jump in is that the banks don't cease to exist. They simply they start. They, they would be run by the FDIC and, and the Fed. And we have this. I mean, this isn't mythical. What's happened? I mean, there's any number of banks. I think it was 500 that went bankrupt uh, last year. Were taken over, resolved by the FDIC, um, and that continues to happen this year. Um, for the most part, if you're a customer of the bank, you know, some of these are fairly large banks. In fact, quite large banks in some cases. Um, they, they usually they do it over a weekend. They they get taken over by the FDIC on uh, Friday night, and you know you can go in there Monday morning and do business just as uh, just as though nothing had changed. So we have a lot of experience with this. This isn't you know it's something you know it's an outer space. We actually do it all the time. We don't generally do it with the largest banks in the country, but we do do it all the time. So you know again this idea we would have gotten the Great Depression. Sure, if all our banks just disappeared. So you know you went down to your bank and you know it's all boarded up, you know, and that was true with all the banks in the country. That would be pretty serious. But that wasn't on the agenda. That was never on the agenda. This was just sort of a mythical thing, a, a scare story that they created to, you know, push their bail up. How do we fundamentally change the story? Um, I've been really happy. You were much more on radio and TV now than you were two years ago, say. So at least you're getting the message out. But I mean, you mentioned trade, and the story on trade has always been trade is good for everybody, and we're free traders, and it's not free trade, it's managed trade in the interest of the big, big people. Same people who are benefiting now. The banks and the big companies. But how do we get people understanding of the stories of lies? Well, that's a really good question. We are making progress. Um, we are making progress. And you have, you know, obviously the media plays a central role here. And you mentioned that, I mean, I'm always glad to be on the shows and everything, but that's not the criteria of success. But the point is that, you know, can we get different viewpoints out there? And that is increasingly true, that we are getting different viewpoints, both in the sense that we have alternative organs. You know, you have the Huffington Post that gets, I think it's like 30 or 40 percent more web hits than Fox on 15, the Washington Post. Um, you know, so, so that's a really great thing. But then also within uh, the mainstream media, the New York Times, there's several outstanding reporters. Gretchen Morgan has done some great reporting on this crisis. Floyd Norris has done some very good reporting. So you had some real changes within the mainstream press also, also. So we have made headway, but it's just a really, really hard road to, to hold here because you know you still get the situation where I mean, talking about the stock market and the economy, I don't know how many people who consider themselves very progressive, they think, oh my God, we can't do that because the stock market will go down. I just remember a piece, that I don't even know who wrote it, doesn't really matter, but it was on Talking Points Memo by some, someone wrote this long thing, like, well, we have to be careful what we do because that can make the stock market go down, and we all know that would hurt us. I'm going, no, you don't know that would hurt us. You don't know what you're talking about. But, but, but there are people who say that. So there's so much, there's such a backlog of misinformation that is often so deeply held by people who, again, I, I mean, I'm sure this person really believed it. He wasn't trying to tell lies, but he was telling lies because he just didn't know. So it's a very, very long process, and, you know, we're, we're in the early stages. And, you know, again, I, I'm reasonably optimistic because we are making inroads, and I'm hugely thankful for the Internet. And I can't imagine where we'd be if we didn't have the Internet because... That gives us both, you know, again, we have our Huffington Post, our Huffington Post memos, you know, all these new organs that are opening up that didn't exist, you know, five or certainly not ten years ago. But also, it gives us a chance to influence the mainstream media. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I'm so, you know, I have watched. Beat the press. You write something stupid, I'm going to write about it. You know, and sometimes they care. Question, then we'll go to the book sign. Uh, 
stopped out any of the advance, including the chase, were um, uh, possibly in trouble because of all of the money that they had. And I'm just kind of wondering what you were Well, commercial real estate had a bubble that almost exactly tracked the path of, of the housing bubble with like a two-year lag. It, it's just kind of painful. I don't, you know, I don't know many of these people, so I don't quite understand how they could have seen this. So basically, what happened was as soon as the, the building boom in residential real estate began to taper off at the end of '05 and '06, commercial real estate takes up the gaps. So commercial construction goes through the roof. You had a Increase in, in, in building and uh, retail and hotel space and uh, office space 40, 50% in 06, 07, 08 compared to the levels in 05. And there's nothing to justify that. So, huge overbuilding, you know, vacant office space, you can see it here in DC, many other places, it's much, much worse. And of course, a lot of those places, you know, they can't repay their loans. And some of those loans are in the books of major banks, some have been sold into um, commercial mortgage backed securities. Um, and a lot of those will go bad. They aren't going to be able to roll those over. Typically, those loans are, are three, four, five-year loans. They're coming due uh, this year, next year, the year after. A lot of them won't, won't roll over because um, they, they don't generate the cash flow to, to, to allow for that. Um, there will be big losses. I don't expect at this point that you will see major banks collapse. Well, two reasons. One is they have rebuilt their reserves to some extent because they're in a situation where you have a large spread between short-term interest rates and long-term interest rates. They can borrow from the Fed at almost zero cost, and you could lend back to the Treasury at you know, three, five, three, six. It's a large spread. If you do that with two hundred billion, three hundred billion dollars, as they are doing, you, you build up, you, you know, you make a lot of profits fairly quickly. So they have rebuilt their reserves to some extent. The other part of the story, of course, is that at the end of the day, the Fed is going to bail them out. So I don't think there's there's much likely that you're going to see J.P. Morgan or anyone else go under from that. They've made it very clear, I think, that in the event that you take big hits, which I'm not saying that necessarily would be large enough to put them under in any case, but in the event that you take big hits from commercial real estate, they will bail them out. Now, on the other hand, there are a lot of banks, more often smaller banks, that do have a lot of commercial real estate on their books. And they will be hit by this, and this is the, the flow. I mean, every week you're going to see, you know, tomorrow night, you know, going the web, you'll see that the FBSC is taking over two or three or four banks. That's probably going to be true pretty much every week this year. There's going to be banks failing every week. Most of them are relatively small, some of them might be reasonable size, and commercial real estate will be a big factor in that. Okay, any concluding thoughts, or should we go to the book signing? Well, concluding thoughts, just, uh, you know, again, I, there's a lot to be pessimistic about here in that, you know, it, it, it's remarkable that the people who blew it so completely are still calling the shots, still seen as great authorities. But, you know, the, there is a lot of cause for optimism. These are complicated issues. People tend to obscure them. The key point is to keep them simple. And, you know, that old line from Watergate, follow the money. Um, that's a good one to do. And, you know, again, I'll, I'll just promote, you know, my pet pet uh, project here, uh, the financial speculation tax, I think we can win on that, and uh, that really will make a big difference. So let's hope we get somewhere. Thank you very much.